Hello and good afternoon, everyone, at least good afternoon from Los Angeles. Welcome to Mirror of Intimacy monthly webinar. Um, I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, Clinical Director at Center for Healthy Sex, and welcome on this February 2nd, 2021. And I was thinking about the date to date and realized in numerology, the number is eight. And eight is a very powerful number. It's the source of power and strength. And it's also the symbol of infinity if you turn it on its side. Um, and I'm very, very attracted to those sorts of symbols and circles, as you can tell by our CHS logo. Um, so I thought that setting the foundation for the topic of virility today on top of power and strength was really synchronous. So virility is a word that comes from the 1500s, it turns out, and it means manhood or masculinity. And the antonym or opposite of that is womanhood or femininity. So I want us to think about virility today, not as strictly a masculine precept or concept that we often think of when it comes to sex and sexuality, but to think about virility as a life force, as an energy as we go forward. So virility is, as I get, as I said, a word that we connote with um, power and strength, but vitality means lively or animated and physical or mental vigor. So these two words are sort of kissing cousins, as it were. They're very, very close in proximity, although they are different. And so I want to think about them somewhat synonymously as we think about this issue of virility today. So the quote from today from James Macefield, actually not from today, but from the entry in Mirror of Intimacy is sex ran in him like the sea. Sex ran in him like the sea, which is a really powerful, simple statement, simple sentence. So what does it mean to have something run through us as big as the sea, as vast as the ocean? That's an enormous amount of energy and when I um, think about how awestruck we are when we um, feel the virility of nature, for example, when it's unimpeded like an ocean or a ranging river, we really can feel the depth and breadth of our own power. And I distinctly remember being on the big island of Hawaii um, years and years ago, standing um, above Waipio Valley. And it's a deep, deep valley for those of you that don't know. And it's extraordinary. It's really an extraordinary valley, this cut right into the side of this island. And I remember standing there and in that moment I had a flash and of recognition that the strength and the power and the beauty of that valley was my own strength and power and beauty. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, as it were. And I would imagine many of you, if not all of you, have had some sort of experience like that where nature just smacked you in the face, where in that moment you had an experience of being one with all of consciousness, all of nature, all of awareness, all of God, if you will, and recognizing that as your own true self. And when you can see your vastness, your beauty, your power, your abundance, your spectacularness in nature reflected back at you, then you can start to get up above the small contracted self that often tells us stories that aren't true about ourselves, about not being vital, not being good enough, etc. So when we start to understand virility as a natural living power, a power that's inside all of us, we will start to feel more forceful, more hardy, more virile, if you will. So think about a time when you have felt this way. Um, was it in nature? Was it with another person? Uh, was it when you were rafting down the Colorado River? or hiking a mountain that you didn't think you could quite make, or maybe you were just giggling and body surfing in the ocean. But when was the time that you felt this power in yourself? And can you just take a moment to call that energy up right now and notice where in your body you feel it and how it has you expanding into your body, into your energy instead of contracting? When you think of virile people, 
or even when we think of fictional characters, we can see this quality of virility inherent in them. It's not something that they're getting from outside of themselves. It's not something that they are concocting in some ways because true virility doesn't come from outside. Um, it really comes from within us, just in the same way that beauty comes from within us. It's not an external job, it's internal. And true virility, because it doesn't depend on outsized sources, um, is something that we have to really cultivate every day. And when I think of different males in cinema, different fictional characters, whether it's Indiana Jones or uh, Jamie in Outlander or Aragon in Lord of the Rings, I think about these virile masculine characters who are also profoundly vulnerable and sensitive. They're kind and they are considering the good of the whole. So these are energies, again, of the masculine and feminine, which harken back to the beginning of time. I think most notably we see this in mythology where Apollo is constructed as the god of the sun and the sun is daylight and daylight is masculine. It's inherently intense, if you will. Whereas the evening, the moon is associated with the goddess Diana or Artemis. She's the goddess of the hunt who is equally powerful in her own way, but her moon cycles align with the cycles of her body. And there's a power in that also. So consider these energies not as gender designations, but as energies in nature that we see that we could name if we were taking a walk or looking at a, a travelogue of nature's beauty. So if you saw Victoria Falls in Africa or Niagara Falls in North America and um, the power of those waterfalls, the vast, vast power that they are throwing down, you know, is it a masculine power? Is it a feminine power? Um, what does that energy do? And can you see the virility and vitality in that and feel that in your own body? Many sexual dysfunctions and certainly often sexual addiction come from a wounded virility and upbringings can certainly maxim or minimize our sexuality um, you know, and whittle it down to nothing typically because Shame in childhood steals a strong sense of self, a vital sense of self, if you will. And with it go vitality states because vitality states are essential um, in order to feel joy and happiness and laughter um, and play. These are very, very alive states in the body. And without those states, um, we're left feeling wanting, we're left feeling um, collapsed, um, or not very available to be present. And certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, not present um, for any kind of sex or sexuality. When children are shamed repeatedly and chronically without any kind of repair, without any parent um, saying, I'm sorry, or I wish I hadn't done that, or let's talk about what you did and what I did and you know, how can we be better together? Um, and really, really regulating the child's nervous system again so that they're not just left in this collapsed state over and over and over again. Um, that creates a more secure functioning human being. A human being can, who can sort of take the, um, the hits of life, if you will, without being destroyed or feeling that they're worthless or nothing. And so if you didn't have that kind of childhood, if you were shamed chronically, if your virility and vitality were stolen from you, then that's going to require an enormous amount of work from you in your own therapeutic processes. Um, individual therapy, perhaps if there's a 12-step meeting that's appropriate for you, um, group therapy, any kind of work that you can do on your own path of personal growth and awareness to restore that inherent power and strength. Um, I think what we see a lot today is we see a lot of people 
uh, whether in, they're in gangs or they are joining conspiracy theory groups, it's because they're feeling so disenfranchised, so isolated, so alone, so lacking in a sense of aliveness. And with that can come a victimhood, a blaming of the other, whether it's blaming the system or blaming the government or blaming aliens um, or blaming you know, our parents. Um, instead of really recognizing that, yes, I've been wounded, I've been hurt, whether I've been hurt by, um, you know, some other forces outside of myself or some other persons, but at some point I have to take responsibility for myself. I have to get myself help. I have to do what's right for me in order to start finding my way back to myself. Because isn't that what everyone is looking for when we talk about going home? We're really talking about a homecoming to our very self, a homecoming to a sense of integration, a feeling of really, really being one with ourselves and one with nature and ultimately one with the universe. But being angry and really um, that anger has us sitting in a place of being a victim where it's somebody else's fault and someone else is doing it to me is quite depleting. And then what happens is that there's a false power that gets adopted, um, whether it's wielding guns or clubs or hassling other people or threatening other people um, or you know, assaulting um, our nation's capital or burning down businesses none of it really is a real power because ultimately we're hurting ourselves. You know, if you kill someone else, you're essentially killing yourself. So being mindful that these external shows of might does not make it right. It actually makes us weaker and harder because we have more resentments and more judgments and we ultimately end up with a lot of self-loathing and hurting ourselves. So think seriously about your own woundedness, about how to start to cultivate a real sense of vitality and virility from within, which might mean your heart has to break open. It means you have to be vulnerable. It means you have to be willing to say, I was wrong, or what I was thinking was not right, um, or I'm just so scared because I feel so alone and I feel like nobody cares about me. And that is the beginning of healing these deep, deep wounds um, about being lost and scared and alone. And often with that shame in childhood comes negative body image, um, a feeling of an exaggerated sense of imperfection, which pervades our culture, uh, where you know women think they're ugly or they're fat or they're part of their body's not big enough or it's too big. And uh, likewise with men, there's an anxiety over sexual aptitude, an anxiety over penis size or height or any number of other measures that really are being measured against external ideals of what's right and what's wrong versus a sense of gratitude, deep gratitude for yourself, for what you do have, for the body parts that you possess, for the fact that you're healthy. And if you're lucky, you're not sick with COVID right now, or worse yet, someone you love hasn't died from it. Um, to really look at the negative body image that you have and ask yourself, where is this coming from? Who installed this in me? And what things do I do to continue to perpetrate those lies? Whether it's excessively looking at fashion magazines, or comparing yourself to other people, or nitpicking your body in some particular way, um, and saying, can I really get over that? And can I do the things that I need to do to make myself feel good, to feel dignified, to feel attractive, without going to great, great pains and lengths to alter you know, myself, whether it's starving myself or um, changing my hair color a million times or lots and lots of plastic surgery. Um, what are you doing to make peace with who you are, to be grateful for who you are? So 
overcompensation for these wounds will show up and they'll show up and they actually, as I said, they inhibit virility. So the perfect person who's bluffing their way through life, who's sort of externally the badass, but they don't really feel that way internally, often have a lot of phobias. They have a lot of neuroses. Um, they're actually quite terrified internally because they're hiding and blocking all of their emotional insecurities. Um, and all of their fears and terrors, and they don't want to make themselves miserable um, because they're afraid that vulnerability will do so. And, and being vulnerable can create misery. It can create a lot of pain and fear, but it is the road out of this false sense of power, this faking of virility, this machismo, this, um, you know, uh, fake ways of throwing weight around in the world that no one really respects. Um, and that creates more damage than it creates good. And likewise, if someone is using sex in order to stimulate or simulate a sense of virility, at some point that wears down quickly also, because you can feel virile whether you're male or female and vital going into a sexual experience. But once you have an orgasm and it's over and you feel flaccid again, not just physically, but internally because you're faking who you are and you feel like you're an imposter, you have to keep chasing that sexual high, that dopamine high, that excitatory state, whether it's through pornography constantly or a new person all the time, because you're trying to pump yourself up in order to feel virile when really you don't. So it's essential that you start to examine that and maybe say, hey, I'm gonna get vulnerable. I'm gonna stop having sex for a year. I'm gonna really take a good look at why it is I need other people to make myself feel this way. Why don't I feel this way naturally? Um, and so it doesn't matter what the thing is that you're clinging to, whether it's sex or violence or conspiracy theory or some other kooky thing uh, that makes you feel like you belong. Maybe it's time to stop and turn towards yourself and not other people's opinions and really start to build a healthy, vital sense of who you are. Part of this happens, I think, in our culture today because we don't have strong, vital role models. And without those role models or caregivers to encourage us um, or without peers to encourage us or the society or the culture that we're living in, our vitality can become stunted. We become unsure, we become insecure, as I've been saying. And when our culture only recognizes virility in this stereotypical way, like you have to look like the rock um, and that's the only way to get it, then that strong silent type, that heterosexual male, that quintessential um, stereotype has a whole lot of people falling short and a whole lot of people disenfranchised because they can't measure up to that. And the irony in that is that that is not a full whole human being. That is one aspect of that human being, but it leaves out that person's heart and soul. It just makes them really kind of robotic that they're just shut down um, and they're tough and they don't cry and they don't have feelings about anything. In fact, as I'm describing it, that's actually quite you know, sociopathic. Um, and so aspiring to that kind of narcissism, that kind of sociopathy does not do our culture and our society any good. Um, all we have to do is take a look around us on any given day and see where that is getting us. So who champions you? Who are the people you turn to where when your heart is broken or when you're scared or when you're lonely um, or when you don't know what's going on in the world that you can go to and say, hi, I need to talk about this or I need some help. Um, who are the people that cheer you on when you are powerful, when you are doing great things, when you have had a victory, um, whether it's in work or in your personal life or some way, who are the people that you surround yourself with that actually take care of you and point you in the right direction of being a fully integrated person, not someone who is split off um, so that you're just one way and you're hiding the other way. In nature, 
virility flowers everywhere. You see it everywhere. You see it in flowers. You see it in waterfalls and trees. Today, in some parts of the country, we're seeing it in snowstorms. And with acceptance and support, men and women of all sexual orientations, of all genetic makeup um, and physiological abilities can enjoy their natural, wholesome virility. And one of the ways you can take charge of this today is saying, how do I take care of myself? How often am I really exercising? How well am I eating? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I really working with my own personal psychology? Have I looked at my family of origin trauma? Um, whether you grew up in a family that was um, insensitive to you and didn't really consider you as a child where you had to do everything on your own um, or in a child in a, a household that was very violent where there was um, physical abuse, emotional abuse or neglect or you weren't fed or tended to. All of these things matter. They all count and they affect us all differently. So don't discount them. Don't minimize them. Face them head on. That's an act of courage and vitality. Invite the flow of your respective energies, your masculine and your feminine, uh, by holding a space for your intention. If your intention is, I want to heal myself, I want to feel virile, I want to feel vital, then really, really um, hold a space for that intention and see if you can keep your attention on what that intention is every day by surrounding yourself by good people and engaging in all sorts of forms of self-care that point you in the direction of feeling whole and feeling powerful internally, um, not looking for external validation. And when you can contain your raw intensity, that vital force you have that has you want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro or go take some kind of wild and crazy trip or jump out of an airplane with a parachute on. Um, when you can really hold that intensity in a secure way, in an emotionally sober way, not in a way that is perpetrating violence on other people or judging other people or assaulting people or, you know, property, then you're really stepping into the power of yourself and of the universe. So it's really more about dominion over yourself and less about raw domination. And when you do that, you really restore the power of your virility. So it looks like we have a question here. Um, the question is, could you talk about false virility and bullying? I have a young son right now who has been experiencing some bullying online and the conversations we have about this can get really exhausting hearing what's being just said to him and just hearing what he's experiencing. I want to make sure I'm highlighting the best points. Well, this is another thing that I failed to mention. So thank you for this. You know, bullying is now a form of childhood trauma. So people can say, yeah, I came from a nice family. Um, but the bullying they experienced in the neighborhood or online is profound and parents can feel helpless trying to intervene on this. But I feel very strongly, um, and this is not just my thought, but the president of Amnesty International once said, you have to knock the bully down. You have got to stand up to the bully. And naturally with your child, you wanna make sure that he's safe, that he's not putting himself in harm's way. But one way to stand up to a bully is to let them know that they're bullying, what they're doing is not okay, and that you're not gonna have contact with them anymore. So sometimes the best thing we can do is just to cut that person out, not respond no matter what, uh, because then they start to harass, um, you know, worst case scenarios that we have to get restraining orders from people like that. So that's one intervention that you can make is to empower your child to stop engaging uh, because it just becomes a tit for tat and having the last word doesn't matter. And then once he stops engaging, that he has a place to talk about, you know, how it makes him feel less than the anger that it evokes in him. And also reminding um, our children that, you know, tit for tat anger is not the answer to these situations. Um, so you don't want your son to just be passive. 
You don't want to train his male aggression or assertion out of him. You want him to feel his rage and his anger. But how do you help him sublimate that into a place that's constructive? Um, and I don't know if that's a sport, if that's weightlifting, if that's um, you know going outside and chopping wood. Um, I don't know what that is, but the brain is designed to move the body. And when us, we're being assaulted, whether it's emotionally or physically, we need to be able to move that energy out. We need to be able to assault back. But hitting at our opponent in this way can be dangerous because this kid that's bullying him could have a gun. I mean, we know how stupid things can get today. So how do you empower your son in his anger and in his righteous rage at being treated so poorly without it being directed back at that particular person, the weak person, the childish person, the narcissistic person who's doing the bullying, because that really is a no-win situation. The daily healthy sex acts for this um, entry in Mirror of Intimacy starts with uh, the question of how do you judge sexual virility in others? Um, and that's a really interesting part of the question because um, I think it's easy to look at someone and think, yeah, they're sort of weak or simpering or not that hot or um, whatever our judgment is in our head. But where does virility really come from? Is it in the size of somebody's muscles? Or does it have to do with the internal muscle they have? I mean, I know for myself and certainly as I've gotten older, um, that the people that are most attractive to me are people who have an internal virility. So they might not be, you know, super buffed or fabulous looking, but their intellect is. Their intellect is extremely virile and extremely um, attractive. Um, and with that comes a sexiness or a sexuality. So how does this match your current perception of your own erotic self? You know, we have these misperceptions of ourselves of what we look like um, and forget that we're actually aging every day and every decade. Um, so just because you might be in good shape at 50 or 60 years old does not mean that you look like you're 30 or 40 years old. So does your own erotic... Um, sense of yourself, perception of yourself, line up with who you are internally? And do you extend that sort of grace, if you will, to people that you're meeting and not assume just based on looks how virile someone is? Can you give them the benefit of the doubt about their virility? Because they may have a very vital life force, which takes you a while to get to know that all of a sudden sparks something in you and you think, oh, there it is. There's that virility. There's that vitality that I never in a million years would have given that person the benefit of showing to me because I was too busy judging them from the outside. Um, and of course, for those of you that are dating now, um, or if you are dating in COVID, I don't know, um, this, one of the benefits of this shutdown from this pandemic has been that it's forced us to take time with everything. Um, so if you're dating, it's forcing you to really, really get to know that person before you have a sexual experience with them. And part of that might be looking for the virility in that person. If you were to experience your virility right now, we could do a brief little exercise here. And I just wanna state a disclaimer about this. This is not about masturbation. This is not about getting sexual with yourself um, while we go through this meditation. So please be respectful of the forum that we're in. And I'll invite you just to take a moment right now, maybe to close your eyes and put both feet on the floor and to take a deep breath into your belly. And one more inhaling through your nose and filling your belly and exhaling. And feel the force of your living body right now. Feel the palms of your hand together and maybe rub them together a little bit so you feel some heat there and feel the aliveness in your hands, feel the blood in your hands. Run your hands along your extremities. So maybe 
cross your arms and give yourself a hug where you can feel your arms, the muscles in your arms, your biceps, your triceps. Give yourself a nice squeeze and feel the life force in this beautiful body, just like a flowing river that feeds everything that it touches. And then run your arms down your hands, feel the tops of your thighs, run your hands along the top of your thighs and feel your muscles and feel your skeleton that's holding you up in this seat right now. Touch your knees. Notice your legs and your feet. Maybe twist your feet and your ankles around and wiggle your toes. And this is your real current of energy. This is every living being, every living piece of energy inside of you. The force that has Niagara Falls tumbling over day in and day out. This is a life force that you possess. That's your sexual life force also. So when we think of sex and sexuality, we think that we should be having sex, but this is a sexual energy that I'm pointing to right now. This recognition that you are a warm blooded, living, breathing animal that has muscles and blood and cells um, powering you up every single day and a heart that never stops beating. So how can you bring this virility to everything that you do today to welcome it, to energize it, to share it with the people that you contact with today. And if you're isolated, start making phone calls, start reaching out, go for a walk, make eye contact with someone today, practice this life force wherever you go. And um, you can also affirm your vitality and that of your beloved. So make sure that you Stop accusing others of being weak and stop accusing yourself of being weak because when you stop the accusation on yourself, you stop it on the others. And know that there is a bountiful vitality behind everything that you perceive. So choose to know life, choose to go forward with this abounding vitality uh, that you can share with other people. All right, so we do have a few questions here. Um, what kind of action items or things or substances can you suggest to help guide a client toward when they are feeling the loss of sexual connection during COVID and they may feel a change from a charge from nature or friends and conceptually the gaining vitality makes sense, but it doesn't seem to translate into feeling more connected or connected to their sexual side. Um, okay, so let me see if I can make sense of this. <clears throat> so I think what this person is writing is that um, people might feel a charge from nature or friends, um, but that doesn't help them feel comforted or connected to their sexual side. And I think what's really important is that every person have their own sexual practice. Just like you have a meditation practice, you have a sexual practice. And this aligns with many of the tantric teachings. And that sexual practice is something that you do for yourself every week. And I'm not talking about compulsive masturbation. I am talking about masturbation on occasion, but I'm talking about a time of sensuality where you can just be with yourself, whether it's taking a hot bath and in that hot bath, um, maybe you're fondling your genitals and you're allowing yourself to just feel the pleasure of touch, of the warm water, of the body. Um, maybe you're not in a bath. Maybe you are in your own bed and you've lit some candles and you're allowing yourself to give yourself a hand and foot massage with oil. Maybe you eventually bring yourself to climax. But all of it is in the present moment with yourself. It's not in fantasy. It's not thinking about porn. It's not about another person. It's about the sheer pleasure in your own body and how do you create these pleasurable charges with yourself um, this may precede or proceed 
you know, then having a delicious piece of fruit, a juicy orange and a hot cup of tea, anything that's sensual that ignites the five senses where you're feeling pleasure. So it's just like creativity. People think of creativity like, oh, I have to write a book or I have to paint some amazing painting. You know, creativity comes in arranging flowers every week, which is what I do. I go to Trader Joe's, I buy flowers and I arrange them. And so I'm a junior florist and, and I love it and I get great joy out of it. It's creative. Cooking is a creative endeavor. And God knows we've been trapped in our houses for a year um, with no restaurants. So we're all having to cook and getting creative about what we're eating is no easy feat. But every little thing that you do that has to do with your five senses is a form of pleasure. And it's a form of sexual pleasure, sensual pleasure, if you let it be. It becomes sexual when you engage your genitals. So see if you can create a sensual practice, a sexual practice for yourself that you are living day in and day out. This is the tantric way. It's about finding pleasure in every little thing every day. Um, can you please elaborate on how we can redefine our feminine virility from what has been heavily ingrained in us from our current social standards? <clears throat> One of the ways I feel virile is weightlifting. And one of the things we know about weightlifting is that it builds testosterone and it protects our bones uh, because strong muscles are what protect women's bones as we age. So feeling virile can feel like I have done something physically demanding and taxing, which makes me feel powerful in my body. That's the one way that I have found to feel that way. Certainly being sexual with a partner allows us to connect to virility because sex is both a masculine and feminine endeavor and those in energy shift and change during the sexual act. So I don't want to tell you to go out and throw some, you know, lumber around, but something that connects you deeply to your musculature, to your body, is something that's going to make you feel powerful. Um, maybe watching, you know, uh, Gail Godot in Wonder Woman will give you a sense of that female virility also, even though that's total fantasy. But my guess is if you work out, if you run, if you lift weights, um, if you do a yoga class that you feel particularly strong after, those are the things that connect us to our physical body. And when I think of virility, I think of the physical body because it's connected, as I said in the beginning, with manhood, masculinity, um, and with testosterone, no doubt. Can you please elaborate? Oops, social media has thrown the phrase narcissism around so much. What is real narcissism? Great question. So narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder is a, a maladaptive configuration of a person's psychology. And narcissism is usually made around the age of three to four years old. And typically what happens at that age is that the toddler is now what they call a senior toddler. And if you've ever seen a child at that age, they are omnipotent. They think they can do anything. They toddle around, they'll grab anything, they'll put it in their mouth, they'll bang on things with it. Um, everything is about me at that age. It's very, very um, self-centered age. That's why people call it the terrible twos and threes. And uh, But it's all about look at me, mommy, look at me, daddy, look at me, look, look, look. And it's the parent's job to regulate that demand by saying, I see you, you're doing a good enough job, you're beautiful, I love you, or clapping yay when the child does something as simple as, you know, put some food in their mouth. All of that is a mirroring process where the child is starting to internalize a sense of I matter, that I'm good enough, that I'm loved internally. So when the child starts to grow up, by the time they're 8, 10, 15, 20, 30, they know they're good enough. They're not constantly asking to be seen, to be looked at. They're not constantly creating drama so that everybody's running and looking at them all the time. And we have seen profound malignant narcissism in our country these last four years, where it's just been about look at me. And people follow suit with that. There's a self-centeredness to it. 
And the true nar narcissist feels incredibly fragile internally. It's the opposite of what I've been talking about. They're fragile internally, but they need the world to revolve around them. They need to be the center of attention at all times. Um, the um, activities they engage in are profoundly self-centered. They don't take other people into consideration. They have very low capacity for empathy. Um, and every move they make is in service of themselves. And so we all have, um, let me just say that narcissism runs on a continuum. Narcissistic personality disorder is a dangerous character uh, because those persons lack empathy um, and they only care about themselves and what's in their self-interest. Then there's narcissism on a continuum. So in order to be able to have a webinar like this for an hour and talk to you about my thoughts and my ideas, I have to have a healthy sense of narcissism. If I don't feel good enough about myself, I wouldn't be able to do this. So narcissism in and of itself is not bad. It's problematic when it becomes malignant and self-centered. So there's toxic narcissism and there's healthy narcissism, just like there's toxic shame and healthy shame and toxic masculinity and healthy healthy masculinity. So whenever we take any of these things and we bend them in order to accommodate ourselves and hurt other people, you can bet we're in the toxic realm. All right, that was a great question. Thank you. So I think this is the end of our conversation here because that was the last good question to end on. So I really, really want to champion you. I wanna support you. I want to love you into recognizing that you are good and true and beautiful and that you um, possess within you the strength and power uh, to be vital, to be vital, to be virile in the world and in all of your activities. And the way that you get there is that it's an inside job. It starts with you doing the work you need to do to be the best that you can be. So go forward, choose life, spread your power and strength and your love in this month of love. And I look forward to seeing you in March. Thank you.